what the planetary boundary framework tries to do is to say, okay, so we have so much evidence that the, the, the stable state of the planet in the Holocene, which we've been in for the past 10,000 years, this Eden's garden of a stable, warm interglacial, is the only state that we know that can support the modern world as we know it, and that we're not pushing ourselves into the Anthropocene, where we humans are actually becoming a geological force of change. Now, when you look carefully into the science, you find, not surprisingly of course, that the climate system, the stratospheric ozone layer, and, and, and the oceans are three very clear big, big global systems that we have paleoclimatic and paleoceanographic data to show that they have tipped and flipped in the past, so we need to include them as planetary challenges. It is, as you say, less um, intuitive that land use change, freshwater use, biodiversity, and interference with nitrogen and phosphorus are part of the kind of planetary stability. But there's growing evidence that for nitrogen, which is one of those that, <coughs> that we assess have been transgressed, that if you load landscapes with too much nutrients, leading to eutrophication, what happens is that ecosystems risk flipping over from desired states, like for example, fish rich and good quality water, or good quality landscapes for producing food to undesired states of you know totally clogged oxygen anoxic ecosystems that do not anymore deliver human well being. So it's from that perspective that both nitrogen and phosphorus <coughs> are part of the story. We have cases at very large scale, <coughs> for example in uh, in the lower parts of the Colorado uh, parts of the Aral Sea or the Baltic Sea, where we're seeing that nitrogen and phosphorus actually push the systems across thresholds that lead to collapse. And we're seeing it in, in, in many, many freshwater systems in, in, in upper landscape from wetlands to, to lake systems. So that's the argument each time. How far can we push key systems beyond which we risk catastrophic tipping points? And, and why is this a global concern? Well, if we flip these systems like lakes, wetlands, in too many places on Earth, you're losing, for example, carbon sinks, which in turn regulate the stability of the climate. So what we're finding is that the biosphere, I mean land, forests, wetlands, grasslands, lakes, they form part of the ability of the entire planet to remain in the Holocene. If you kind of erase too much of your nature, you end up in a situation where you cannot exclude that you move much, much more rapidly out of the Holocene stability. That's why nutrients play a role. So the, the purpose of putting numbers, of course, to then ask science for each of these processes, what's, what's the evidence showing? Beyond what point do we start seeing abrupt nonlinear changes? And the quantification is at the point, the boundary, beyond which you not necessarily have a tipping point, but when you come into the zone of uncertainty where science is saying, hey guys, here we start seeing the risk of tipping points. And the interesting thing is that since the 2009 publication, we've got so much evidence that many of these boundaries were very well placed for climate on 350 ppm. We see now the abrupt tipping point in the Arctic occurring. On nitrogen and phosphorus, we've actually been criticized for putting the phosphorus boundary too high because there's so much evidence that phosphorus has pushed big systems across thresholds, particularly lake systems. So we're now adjusting that boundary. So there are, there is, um, the, the key is to always find empirical evidence of how far can you push a control variable before finding tipping points. There is a scientific challenge to understand interactions. That's absolutely true. For example, how far can you degrade land before you have a feedback into the climate system? And, and we're in interna internalizing right now, for example, the research on the risk of having a, a rainforest tipping point with big rainforest systems flipping over to savannas due to land use change. And if that occurs, you would have such a boost of carbon and methane and, to some extent, also nitrogen and phosphorus which in turn would have a feedback on the monsoon systems and on climate. So the key is to, to find boundary positions that cater for both tipping points induced 
within exactly that parameter, like nitrogen, phosphorus, and water, but also to be sure that you're not pushing one system too far so you get a feedback which makes other boundary processes too vulnerable. So, so the safe operating space that, that then establish itself once you've quantified all the nine boundaries is, is a true safe operating space. It's a safe operating space where, in fact, the working hypothesis is that they, they operate like three musketeers, you know, one for all, all for one. You, you can actually, you have to stay within the sustainable boundaries of all of them, most likely, because if you breach one, you change the position of another. So they are uh, hardwired in that sense. The, the, the normative, or let's say the, 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 not the criticism, I would say the dialogue that this approach has, has uh, raised is that, well, isn't there, isn't there a choice to be made by society where you place the boundaries? And that's absolutely true, because you could argue, well, okay, we have such enormous development needs in a certain region that we need to simply increase coal, natural gas and oil use, we need more phosphorus and nitrogen to be able to feed a certain region or even the world. So we need to accept that the boundary is perhaps a bit closer to the ultimate tipping point position. So then you would argue more for what, we, what, we, what we've called an optimization approach. The boundary approach that we've proposed is based on taking the precautionary principle very seriously. We're saying that as soon as you enter the scientific uncertainty zone, let's place the boundary at the lower end. Like for climate, the uncertainty is between 350 ppm and 550 ppm for concentration of CO2. We placed at the lower end because that's where you enter the scientific uncertainty zone. You could operate against a higher level, but then you take bigger risks. Mm -hmm.